you. Thanks. Um, all right. So um, I think the talk was about um, UX considerations in property real estate. But what I really want to talk about is how we actually help people find their homes. Um, first, a little bit about me. So um, I actually have a lot more experiences in the telco sector where I worked for 12 years and what also made me come uh, to Singapore. Um, but I'm with Property Guru here um, in Singapore for a year now, and I have to say it's, uh, I have learned a lot. So, um, but when I first got contacted about the job, I was like, well, property, really? It doesn't sound that sexy, right? <laughs> it's not fintech, you know, it's not what everybody is talking about. So when I looked into it, actually, there is nothing that's more valuable on the world than the global real estate, estate sector. So... Um, this is not a typo, this is in trillion USD. So all the property in the world that's kind of owned, all the land, all the forest, this is what all of it is together. It's 207 trillion USD. Um, compared to uh, the little one uh, over there, all gold ever mined only comes up to 6 trillion, though still quite a lot. Um, a lot of it might be a bubble, and if you kind of talk to economists, they will tell you, yes, but, and maybe the numbers looked a little bit different in 2008. This is from uh, 2016, might be a little bit different now. But, so property is a huge thing. Moving on. Um, and also here, especially in Asia Pacific, we see a lot of um, prop tech. Yes, we also had to call it like that. Um, <laughs> There are about 180 prop tech startups in, um, in Asia Pacific. There is a lot of the investments that are coming in, kind of happens here in this region. Um, a lot of it is in China, but also the majority of investments are in marketplaces and brokerage, in rental spaces, etc. There is a lot of very, really, really interesting kind of businesses ideas, business ideas going on. Um, so we are where Property Guru Place is kind of the lower border here. It's about brokerage, it's about leasing, it's about listings, what we do. Um, there is a lot in property management. How can we, you know, make it easier for people living in condos to access their facilities? How can um, we make it easier for developers to manage all their properties, etc.? Coming up to project development, there is a lot of insights, a lot of data that's kind of going in there. It's like, because when I build as a property developer, when I start building my project today, it takes a few years. Will it still be um, a good neighborhood? Will it still have, you know, all the supermarkets, etc. coming up? Does it have the right kind of people? Does it have the right audience, etc.? And I think on top of it is um, definitely investment and financing, both for developers, for agents, but also for consumers. Okay, so um, I want to go through a few of the drivers for why prop tech is kind of hot. Um, obviously, there is a huge urbanization going on in Asia. I think this is um, not news to anybody here. 40 out of the 46 um, most rapidly developing cities are in Asia. The drivers here are mainly India and China, but Southeast Asia is kind of big. Um, <coughs> the second one is kind of interesting. So the middle class in all of those countries and the millennials, which is the biggest one, it's actually one of the biggest generations, they are in their prime spending years. That means, how many of you in here, I think you all fall into the millennial category pretty much, how many of you have considered buying a property or bought a property recently? Yeah, quite, quite a few. If you're a Singaporean, it's probably easier than if you're a foreigner in Singapore. <laughs> um, but also, when it comes to property, because it's a super duper high ticket item, it basically um, has a lot to do with trust. So you actually don't go on an e-commerce portal and say, oh yeah, I want to have that kind of white t-shirt, I want to have that house, and say, yeah, click checkout, right? So um, people kind of do think, do have trust issues, and they do definitely prefer the kind of personal touch. They want to talk to an agent, they ask their family for advice, etc. right? Um, and also I think in, because we are not only in Singapore, but in other markets, um, people do not necessarily trust the information that they have or that they might not have or the government, right? So when we do research, for example, in Indonesia, people have questions like, yeah, but is this a flood area where you kind of develop that new uh, project? Or um, 
does that person who says he actually owns this resale apartment really own it? Because legal documents are not always for sure. So there is a lot of trust issues and also the kind of societies here, they are sometimes really low trust societies that we operate in. Um, one of the one of the next things that um, is kind of interesting for the whole prop tech industry is that there is selective support from governments, positively and negatively, that kind of impacts us. So, for example, if you think about Airbnb in Singapore, the question always is, can I do it? Is it legal? You know, etc. Then there is a lot of... Um, more positive support, for example, thinking about Bitcoin and everything that's kind of all coming up with um, what Irina talked about earlier, open APIs and all those kind of things. So all those are considerations that um, we kind of have to take into account when we talk about prop tech in general. Um, one thing that hit us really hard very recently, for you, or not really hard, but it hit us, cooling measures in Singapore. Anybody knows what it is? No, so the government, <laughs> yes, one person, thank you. Uh, so basically what happened is that um, the property prices in Singapore were rising up due to kind of, uh, I think, several on block sales, big sales, and lots of people are coming kind of in the market. And what the government did to kind of avoid creating a huge bubble, creating too much demand, is that they put in cooling measures. That means basically when you want to buy a property now, you have to, or a second property, you have to pay a lot more in taxes. So that kind of dampens the market and it dampens our traffic, etc. All right, but um, I think enough about the market, the ecosystem. How do we actually help you find your home? Because as I mentioned, helping people find their home or basically making the decision of finding a home is something that you do one to maybe three times in a life, like marriage or having kids, etc. So it's, a, it's quite a big decision and most of the people, especially here in the region, in the region um, are basically um, on the verge of kind of buying their first home and they need a lot of help and they need a lot of um, <coughs> They need a lot of trust, they need a lot of kind of trusted sources where they can find more information. So um, when we talk about design in Property Guru, we talk about designing for trust. Um, this is kind of really, really simplified our business model, right? So we have consumers who give us their time, their effort, their data, um, and in turn, we hopefully help them to facilitate to find their home. Um, on the other side, we have property agents and developers who give us their money to advertise on our platform, to have their um, listings there, to have their banners there. And in return, what we give them is hopefully growth for their business, right? Um, but the currency that is all underlying and the underlying principle is trust. Our company vision is also trust. So we want to be the trusted advisor for every person seeking property. That doesn't mean only consumers, it means agents and it means property developers as well. But this is what basically guides our design and UX in general. <coughs> so um, this is pretty much the framework that we kind of think about when we design something new. Um, very simple, um, starting from the bottom here, um, we say, okay, whenever we create something or we design something, first of all, it needs to be functional. So what that means, yeah, it needs to kind of fill basic usability standards. It needs to be accessible, it needs to be findable, etc. The layer on top of that is convenience. So this is when kind of good UX really starts. When we say, okay, it's not only, um, it doesn't only work, but it also easy to use, it's simple, it does what you want, and it's kind of convenient for me to use. Um, but when we come into the two upper parts, this is where it kind of get hard. So um, when we talk about pleasurable, how many experiences have you ever used that were kind of pleasurable? How many do you remember? It's really about what is kind of uh, an experience that you remember. Um, for example, it's not always necessarily a product that you have used, right? For example, I was recently taking a flight to the US with Eva Air and they have this amazing experience when you take their Hello Kitty airline. 
So basically, at the check-in, you get Hello, Hello Kitty tickets, you get Hello, ticket, Hello Kitty everything, right? In the plane, the cutlery is Hello Kitty. What do you do? You kind of share all those things. You keep it in your memory. It's really amazing. My little daughter, four years old, she still talks and wants, oh, can I please fly with the Hello Kitty plane again? <laughs> so this is a pleasurable experience. Didn't cost them much and was mainly marketing, but still people will remember. Um, and then the... The kind of part that we put on top is trust, right? So how do we design for trust? How do we make sure we, we don't fuck up your experience ever, right? There is, yes, <laughs> if you do that once, it says in any relationship, if you do it once, it's really, really hard to get it back, right? And I think this is one of the truths of design, right? If you fuck it up once, it's really hard to get it back. Um, this is what we're trying to achieve, not always, right? So most of the time, 80% of, of our products, 80% of the time you use it, this is enough, yeah? Because otherwise, if we would always go the full way, it will take us forever to get anything done or get anything out because you need to do a lot more research, you need to go a lot deeper into what does trust actually mean? What is your context that you're designing for? So most of the time, this is good enough, especially in like the super fast-paced startup world that we operate in. So this is the 20%. And actually, I, s I thought instead of you know, sharing some principles, blah, 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 I want to share some examples of um, how, what we did and how we basically designed for trust. So the first one, if you go on our product, which is our main site, what do you see? <laughs> Not so great images, we all love those. <laughs> so our number one consumer complaint is, I don't want to see that, I want to see the actual unit, I want to see that actual apartment, right? We know, we, yeah, we know that. Um, <laughs> but what you actually see is that, right? And those are, those are not examples that I specifically curated. I just went to our site one day and took out some photos. So this is actually how it really looks. And um, I have to say we are, we are all aware of this. Um, we actually are doing something against. So what do we do? We could basically say, no, 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 you cannot do that anymore at all. But there is a need for agents as well. So we are a marketplace. We on, not only have consumers, we have agents. So what is the need for agents here? We think about, oh, I want to show my face. I want to show my phone number. I want to market myself. This morning when I came in, I saw an agent who kind of bought a whole kind of back of a bus to market himself. There is no listing, there is no apartment, there's only the agent face and his phone number, which is, wow, okay, must be a very successful agent. Um, <laughs> So how, how do we, how do we uh, work around that? So we have introduced something that's a quality, what we call quality photo guide. So it's basically um, artificial intelligence or image moderation through machine learning. Because what we have, we have 17K photos alone that are uploaded every day in Singapore and you cannot moderate them. So what we did is we trained our quality photo guide um, to basically detect all those images. Um, we don't want collages, we don't want anything um, kind of written on top of images, we don't want broken images, we don't want faces or floor plans, all those on floor plans, all those kind of things. We don't want nudes. Actually, we, um, earlier this year, <laughs> no, 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 not a joke. So we, we had recently had to train our system to detect nudes. Earlier this year, I think it actually made it into the news. Uh, somebody had the great idea to kind of take photos of his apartment and strip and forgot about the mirror, so it happens. <laughs> um, so it's now also detecting those kind of things. Um, but what we didn't do is we didn't enforce it. So what we, what we do is we are trying to tell the agents when they create their listings, when they upload the images, what is a good image. So for example, at the point of uploading, we tell them, do use that, do use something bright, don't use, put your name or your face over it, don't use um, collages, etc. right? And actually our photo quality got quite a bit bigger, I think it was around a quarter in the last time I checked. Um, 
since this is on, so there is zero enforcement. Yes, we could enforce it, and yes, we could kind of hinder agents from uploading these images, but it's getting better slowly by just educating people positively. Um, we also have a quality store, uh, score that helps with that as well, so it will, it's kind of compromised of how many photos you have uploaded, what is the quality of the photo, etc. Um, yep. Good. Another example of one of our recent products um, is around affordability. So in Malaysia, more than 60%, I think this is also where it comes back to kind of those banking APIs that we heard about earlier. Uh, more than 60% of all mortgage applications currently are rejected. So this is due to reasons that a lot of people are not even aware, right? So what you can do is basically, <coughs> you can do a credit check. And if you do a credit check today, you will basically need to go um, fill out long, lengthy forms and pay like, I don't know, I think it's the equivalent of 20 bucks to give it to the credit agency that will check and then you will get a number which is called the deaf service ratio that will come back and will tell you if you are eligible to even get a credit or not. And there are lots of factors in there. If you have paid your credit card bills, if you have ever had a credit before, things like that, what's your monthly income, etc. So um, one of the products we built uh, together with a partner was kind of based on Okay, how do we make that, how do we automate that process? How do we make it super easy to access for people? And how do we make it free? And actually we did all of that. So um, it's, uh, it kind of ended up in like a sh super sh uh, short four step approach where you basically put in your um, name, your NRIC number, um, your income. Um, but not details, right? It's just really basically five or six fields. We do a credit, run a credit check with the credit check agency and back you get. So we basically say, okay, this is your debt service ratio. You're in the green or you're in the red. That actually means you can afford a mortgage for this and that amount, right? And then when, once we have that, we can also show you the relevant properties. It's free and it's accessible to everyone. Together with that, we also kind of run a campaign um, to basically help people with more information, with case studies, with, um, <coughs> with other kind of tools and calculators to help them kind of um, get more information or basically own their affordability and hopefully in the future be able to buy and afford a home. Okay, <coughs> one of our, sorry. <coughs> One of the projects that we are um, currently working on, and this is very much a in-progress thing, um, is we are reimagining our search. And I see my team here laughing. <laughs> so um, we, thanks. We recently set out to say, okay, our search engine or our search backend, and probably our tech guys will kill me if I say that, but at the moment it's really old. We're like, we have a 10 year old tech stack that we're currently slowly updating. And it doesn't support the, um, experimentation. It doesn't support new features, etc. So we said, okay, let's redo our search. And also let's take the time and kind of reimagine how we can do search. This is a little bit about the process and what we did. So um, we went through a phase of doing quite a bit of research on search to basically build out personas, um, find out what are their core issues with searching. And um, the journey here is actually really, really interesting, bec interesting because it kind of starts from being Oh, I don't even know where to start. It's all really, really overwhelming. Um, what do I do with my current house? What do I do with resale, etc.? cetera? Um, so this is just one of the journeys that we did with our, with our kind of stakeholders. Um, until the actual searching, right? How can you make it easier for me to find my property? At the moment, we have zero relevance. If you go on our site, you have zero personalization and we want to change all that. So how did we do that? After we did basically, um, <laughs> after we did um, our user personas, we did lots of workshops with our stakeholders to kind of come up with some ideas and opportunities and what to do. We went into quite a, um, into user testing. And so this is where we currently are. So it's really work in progress. We have a few rounds that we did. We're kind of refining prototypes. Um, on top of that, what I'm not showing here, so those are the kind of close closer to happening very soon prototypes. We are also exploring other options of searching. There is um, a theme um, that is around voice search because everybody is kind of having a Google Home or an Alexa, not everybody, but soon we hope everybody will. And then 
why don't you just search um, on our portal with that? Or um, another idea that we had and that actually came out of one of our internal hackathons was um, VR search. So if you're new to Singapore, for example, have you ever wondered, what's that condo over there? Can I live there? What, what does it cost, etc.? Are there any free units? So basically, we have come up with a product that will allow you to do that very soon. Um, all right. <coughs> so the other side of the medal is agents, property agents. How do we make their lives better? And also those are wireframes, and I'm, I'm actually not showing nice and finished products here. Um, but what we have uh, figured out is that agents, especially when they get started, also through research, they, have, they often don't know where to start. They don't know which kind of units to source. They don't know where to go, what is currently hot. So we created um, a piece of insight for them, which is called Market Supply Gap. Um, it, will basically give them, um, it will basically give them a way to see, OK, here is um, high supply, but low demand. Probably not, let's not go there. Or the other way around. We will tell them, we will tell them um, where is a good place to source? How does it help us? It helps us in a way that we can steer the kind of um, supply. Because when we say, OK, you know what? We have so much demand. People really, really want to find apartments in Novena. But we don't have enough listings there. And people don't come back. We can get our agents to go there and do that, for example. Um, another part of insights, very basic things, right? So what we want them to show is how their listings are performing. How, they do, how do they compare with others? There is very few tools in the market that currently do that. So yeah, that was some of the examples. Um, the slide that they made me do, basically, uh <laughs> um, we're the tech leader across five markets. We, are, um, we have 55% market share in Southeast Asia. We just recently bought a company that's more than double the size than we actually were in Vietnam. Um, and we also just recently got 200 million from KKR, so it's a great place to work for, and we are hiring. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, okay, we can do questions if you guys have any. Don't don't ask me about our tech stack, please. Yeah. <laughs> any questions? Any questions from the floor first while we're setting up the Slido? Yes. Yes. Uh, first is price. So I, it doesn't allow for variability. Like if you put in, I want something that's about $2,000, it keeps a hard cap, whereas there could be a really good property available for 2050, right? But it, it wouldn't show me that. Uh, then there is the idea of uh, area, right? Area is very fixed. Now, I could not have selected one whole area, but I could have something that's just crossed the boundary uh, that would be interesting to me. Uh, so there are, like, the filters are really hard filters right now, uh, and it makes for, s like, it excludes a lot of options at times. Uh, yeah, it does. So this is one of the <coughs> reasons why we are revisiting our search, because we know it's not fit, right? Um, we know there are lots of other products that people currently use, right? When is the last time you searched on Netflix, for example? So what we want is we want to have a more relevant experience and we want to serve you with the right insights as well. So for example, as you said, like a good agent does, right? Um, you start searching in one area because somebody told you this is good, but actually a good agent will tell you, hey, have you considered that area over there? Because it kind of meets your requirements too, for example, right? Or have you considered spending a little bit more because you will get, that's what they do anyway, but <laughs> you will get so much more value for that. So yes, this is um, what we're currently working towards. No, more other questions? Maybe we can get a question from oh. Saido. Um, what do you think about the rise of new platforms that offer homeowners the option to list their property? So bypassing property agents. Ah, that's a tricky question. Um, 
I think, no, I think it's great. Um, and I feel that, um, you know, in other markets like the US or in Europe, this is also very often how it works. It's listed by owners. Also one of our markets, for example, Thailand, we have that option to do that because there is way more listings by owners. Um, what is here is just the way the market is. And as I said, agents are our customers. We want them to help succeed. So there are several reasons why we say no, we, we, we don't do that at the moment. But um, I think there is definitely a need in the market for it. So yes, great initiative. How do you reconcile trust with this statement? Okay. Recent protest by agents price hike for packages. Yes, it happens. So um, let me talk about that. So what happened when we um, had a price hike, what we actually did, we doubled our price in Singapore and for agents. And you know what? We had actually not a lot of agents that we lost because they came all back to us. The reason is, okay, we own 80% of the market, but also we deliver really, really good value, right? So they get most of their leads through us. There is no other place for them to go. So that's what I think. <laughs> How we get agents insights? No, we don't hire a market research firm. We have our own researcher and currently an open role for that one as well. So we do all our research, all our design in-house. Anything else? Image recognition, giving the agents... Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, we could, we could, we could do that. Um, but I think um, agents, they, they manage up to 100 listings, right? So basically, if you, um, if you, we give them the possibility to enter information, um, to describe their images, to describe their listings, right? But what we find is that a lot of agents don't do it and sometimes often copy it over. So it's kind of, for us, it's a really, really big theme is how do we determine quality and how do we measure the quality of our listings by agents to make sure we kind of, kind of get it up, right? Also, honestly, there are quite a few listings that are not genuine on our side, and all those things are considerations that we kind of take to see how can we make that better through design, through kind of guiding agents better to have good quality, um, to have good quality photos, to have good quality descriptions, and not to kind of uh, create uh, clickbait postings, basically. All right. How do we measure the success rate of fire design? We. <laughs> um, what we don't do at the moment, <laughs> but what we are planning to do, um, is basically implementing an integrated measurement system. So um, at the moment we measure product success, as I guess a lot of companies do. But um, as, we, as we are striving to design for trust, we basically um, are implementing a system where we say, okay, no, we don't only measure product, but we also measure um, product quality, but we also measure product experience, and we also measure um, things like brand perception, and we're kind of pulling that together to measure how good our products are. Right. Yeah, exactly, how do we measure trust? That's a really hard one. <laughs> Um, so it is, about, it is about product quality on the lowest level, but then it's about the experience that you have with the product plus the kind of brand perception and brand experience. This is what we are thinking to measure because those are the things that we measure in terms of trust. Okay. Do we have any more questions from the floor? Asian or is it a what what is your main priority building the trust is it to the agent or is it the customer who's like buying the houses um, it's the high the more the priority is consumers the customers who find the trust because with the agents we have basically you give us money you get something in return relationship so it's kind of not that hard to build trust, right? So if I say, okay, you pay us X number of money, I give you X number of leads, and then you make sure you basically um, kind of convert them into people buying their houses. So yes, it's on the consumer side, which is a lot harder. Yeah, I think 
thing is very hard because a lot of people using the property guru, they actually experience through the agent as well. Yeah. Right? Like so when they have a, like a bad experience with the agent, it also may might affect to the property guru too, you know? I don't know. I mean it might that's how I feel. It might that always happens. If you have a bad experience with Apple, it might also reflect bad on Singtel. So it's you know <laughs> some of the learning. Okay. There's Any more questions? I think we have time for one to two. In that particular area, so you can check out the map, if the size of the pool and everything. Now, it seems like we're just like a step away, like I could just probably use Google to uh, do the search. So how do you keep up with the competition? Like, like one day probably Google would take over the property view of Singapore. <laughs> so um, how do you keep up with the competition? This is true, but um, it is a business about volume, right? So um, I think as competition, you're right. It is Google, it is Facebook, it is rather those guys that have marketplaces, but none of them has the knowledge that we have for of over 10 years. Um, and none of them have the sheer amount of agents that list with them. So it would be really, really hard for any business to come up with, yeah, basically to get all those listings legally. <laughs> My question is when you're designing for the agents and for the customers, so I'm pretty sure there is some system for agents that they have to access in order to keep a pool of customers and then so uh, sometimes there's a merge happens between the agents and the consumers when they like the personas when it comes in play right now. So how do you manage this integration between these two things and then uh, what are the challenges you face? All the time. So I think there, um, our job is a lot about trade uh, trade offs between consumers, consumer experience, and agent or even developer, property developer experience who advertise on our platform. Because on the one side, you have the paying customers that kind of pay your paycheck. On the other side, you have the consumers that you kind of need to come. So it's basically every discussion we have, um, we have to make those trade offs, right? And um, there are a few rules and guidelines around that where we basically say one of our principles is consumer first because very similar to our learning from Google is, is also Google says put the customer first, all the, uh, the rest will follow. So we are following a very similar principle. Sometimes we also just put our agent and our consumer director in a room and let them fight it out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Catherine, for sharing thank your you. insights and for generously answering questions.